episode of Founders Trade by Gaber.io. Today we have Jim. Jim is the Chief Operating Officer of Wellness Wits. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So Jim, a brief introduction about yourself, about your current role. What, what are you doing? What kind of advising? What is your full-time role? So for the audience, please. Absolutely. So I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Wellness Wits. Uh, Wellness Wits is a mobile patient engagement app that uh, differentiates itself because we leverage something called shared medical appointments or shared medical visits. It's a established methodology by which a uh, provider clinician can actually see more than one patient at a time, typically five to eight, but could be up to 10 in one single encounter. Uh, And uh, there are both mechanisms for Uh, capturing the encounter notes, as well as uh, using billing codes to be able to perform that. Um, Additionally, we're developing something called group therapeutics, which is a lot like being in a Facebook group, except that instead of being on Facebook um, on an unregulated platform, it's done in conjunction with cohorts of other patients under the guise of a physician. Uh, And and that mobile app uh, is being used for a number of providers already in the Houston area where the company is based and rolling out to a number of additional providers as well. Got it. Got it. So wellness, which, you know, uh, uh, I believe like uh, any flourishing uh, companies, they have an AI roadmap for patient engagements. And uh, so would you want to discuss that? What kind of initiatives uh, are you taking at Wellness Wits and how AI is transforming patient interactions and experiences? Absolutely. And we're very excited about our AI roadmap. Uh, Our AI roadmap is being built in partnership with IBM. Uh, IBM is our uh, channel and development partner leveraging their Watson X community. Um, our rollout for, for AI, and of course, when you say AI, most people immediately think of the, the big, broad, generative AI capability. Um, but our approach in a kind of a crawl, walk, run is to leverage the capabilities of Watson first as a chatbot type feature um, to be able to answer a set number of questions and types of questions from patients as they're using the app. Um, that help guide them in terms of their appointments or what their care plan is or how to attend appointments, et cetera. Um, nice. Next, we'll be moving into other tools that will do discovery against a discrete set of clinical data, evidence-based documentation that supports their particular conditions or um, or treatment plans. So as we roll out to provider practices, maybe one practice is a gastroenterologist and another practice is a nephrologist, So there's differences there between obesity and and glucose monitoring and blood sugar and diabetes. And with someone else, with the nephrologist, of course, it's concerned about, you know, chronic kidney disease, uh, kidney failure, other problems there. Those, of course, both have their own specialty um, cadres of information that we want to support the patient with. So beyond just a chat bot, being able to ask questions and gather information based on physician curated evidence-based information that's that's documented within the system that's retrievable. And then ultimately we look at generative AI models, um, hugging face and others that we would build in for large, lar- large learning models uh, that uh, we will develop into over the course of the next oh, 12 months or so. All right. So, you know, that's amazing. And, you know, just, you know, because just think, uh, far thinking out like seven years from now you know why because uh, in the last few months you know we have seen all kind of uh, uh, speculative theories in regards to that you know the disruptions that ai is gonna bring right so what role uh, do you see ai playing in like future like six years down the lane seven years down i know it's transforming so far uh, but, you know, let's just be speculative about it, right? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And and um, a foundational role for Wellness Wits is to be able to assist the patient in managing their care journey, engaging with their clinician, managing their care plan, and, and uh, whether it's primary care or specialty, being able to uh, manage their own wellness in a variety of ways. 
Um, we have an industry as an industry have a big challenge over the next six to seven years, certainly the next 10 years in particular, with 10 years kind of being a, a roadmap. And I'll and I'll talk to that in a minute. Um, uh, there was a time about seven years ago or so that I was with another company and we were a technology partner for robotic process automation. And back then, no one was talking AI. It was all about robots and robotic process automation. Yeah. And I'd present to large groups in a public sector and say, hey, robots are not here to take your jobs. Robots are here to take your jobs when all of you retire. And I'd say this to a room full of people that, like myself now, had a bunch of gray hair and were on the cusp of retirement. And, and those are groups of individuals that are retiring and organizations where people are leaving to retire that don't necessarily have a bunch of people that take their place. We know more and more about the changing demographics of America, the aging and graying of America. It's a problem across the Western world. And that's no different than healthcare. Uh, if you look at the surveys for most large physician associations, you'll find by and large that the median age for most physician associations, and you can pick one, I'll pick the American uh, um, Association of Family Practitioners, the median age is 55. Well, if you add 10 years to that by you know, 2023, 2024, um, most of their population will be at retirement age. And when you factor in stories of burnout and difficulties with reimbursement and, and basically things that are challenging physicians to practice medicine these days, it's very easy to see that when doctors get an opportunity to retire, they're going to do just that. Well, there have been you know, plenty of other articles about how are we replacing our physicians? How are we building new pipelines to replace these physicians? And just in terms of demographics, those numbers aren't going to work. So to the extent that an app like Wellness Wits can engage the patients, manage time better with the provider, uh, get things done more efficiently and manage their care plan, and then we begin to begin to build in things like AI to offer um, uh, actual virtual assistance care, guide the patient through in the absence of a doctor. So, you know, there's there's a lot of talk on LinkedIn that you know, AI will never replace a doctor. I would advocate it better come up with a way to do it and better come up with a way to do it in 10 years because we already have significant populations in the U.S. that have limits, severe limits to specialty care. Um, you have severe limits to hospitalization or local hospitals, 40 percent of rural uh, hospital facilities, healthcare facilities uh, are at risk of failure between now and next year. Uh, all of that needs to be addressed in some way with new technologies uh, and AI has a very, very promising journey to be able to do that. So, you know, uh, we keep our these uh, podcasts, you know, within 15 to 20 minutes, you know, short and precise because we want to extract the maximum value out of them. So, you know, my last second last question would be, you know, since you have someone who's been working extensively in the RPA space has then as well as in the AI space and, uh, you know, for the young startup founders who are just coming out and, you know, kind of like uh, going through these turbulent times and, you know, want to work in the digital health or the AI space, any kind of particular piece of advice would you want to give to individuals who are thinking to start or who have just started? Uh, yeah, and I think I'd, I'd sum up in two words, open source. Um, I come from a background in Linux Foundation working in open source. Um, the Linux Foundation maintains the, the LF AI and Data Foundation, which has a tremendous amount of focus on open source tools, um, machine learning, security, etc. And I think that between things like the newly released executive order from President Biden, as well as the AI Act uh, in the EU and other similar pieces of legislation, the uh, transparent, accountable nature of open source is going to be critical for AI success over time so as to avoid a real Hindenburg type incident, um, whether that is open source around the LLMs that are in use, open source around the algorithms, some combination uh, with both, um, Anthropic, Hugging Face, which I've already mentioned, are very heavily involved with open source to AI. Um, open AI is not in some cases, and I think you're starting to see challenges as a result of that, but I think that there's going to be a lot of foundational bedrock so to offer an example, if the U.S. government continues its trend building on the executive order, there may be a possibility that CMS will demand or mandate that um, uh, AI that is used in uh, Medicare and Medicaid, which constitutes such a huge part of our healthcare spend, 
um, have to have uh, open source explanations, open source transparency, and has to be built in specific to healthcare, regardless of how other industries may do things. Open source may not be as uh, uh, necessary for, say, you know, uh, um, uh, marketing or customer service. Um, but I think when it comes to evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practices and demonstrating um, clinical veracity, open source is going to be huge. So last question, you know, recession, tough times, tech layoffs. What do you think is going to your, your speculative stance for 2024? Yeah, so um, uh, setting aside the difficulties in the tech industry, I think we still watch within the U.S. here a healthcare industry that has uh, a lot of systemic and foundational challenges in both how care is delivered as well as how that care is reimbursed. At the end of the day, in some mechanism, a, a, an expert uh, such as a doctor delivers a service to help someone get well. And that person could be a six month old baby. It could be a 65 year old man. Uh, it ranges the spectrum of what it might be and who it might be that they're, that they're delivering care for. Uh, but at the end of the day, there has to be an economic mechanism for doing it. A lot of that economic mechanism is, is, uh, is severely challenged by the systemic model that we have for delivering health care. And we'll have to come up with new ways to doing that. I think at the end of the day, no matter what kind of new model there is and their new healthcare consumerism, the patient's ability to have their data, manage their data, and have tools like AI to be able to assist them with their care journey and managing their care plan is going to be a critical part of empowering people to do that and kind of help weather the storm as there's uh, uh, various tumultuous changes in how you receive care, where you receive care, and how that care is compensated and reimbursed. Jim, it was a pleasure having you on our show. You know, pleasure thank you so much for taking the time out, you know, and uh, we'll definitely would love to have you in one of our quarterly AI healthcare webinars. But, you know, till then, take care. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. It's been great being here and I look forward to it. And we have stopped.